the other question I had was when is our next assignment you were thinking of we would have to do? Um, yeah, so let me get over and talk about those things. But yeah, the, the next assignment, I did want to have one kind of over support vector machine. So I'll also post that here. And um, I mean, I originally planned it to be due at the end of, you know, not this week, but next week after we go through support vector machine. So I'm still kind of planning on that, I think. So um, yeah, so since I, since I wasn't recording that, that I just talked about, um, um, if, if the guys that are here will kind of allow me to repeat a little bit of that. Um, so, um, I just posted um, some lecture notebooks this week for um, the Caden Nearest Neighbors and the Naive Bays. So, like, like I said in the announcement here, if you haven't done a Git poll today, you'll need to do that. So, so if you go here, uh, so these lecture notebooks are under the um, the archive under our lectures in the repository. If you don't see the U09 Caden Nearest Neighbors and the, the U09 Naive Bays, you might have to do a Git poll. So either open up a terminal on your host machine, or you should be able to open up a terminal on your um, uh, even inside of your virtual machine and just change into the directory and do a Git poll, um, and that should pull down that. That notebook that I just put in there for you. So, all right. Uh, and I also don't have a video really yet, a standalone video. Uh, I'm probably not going to make one for the K nearest neighbors. So, if anybody wants that who's not participating interactively here today, I'll probably point them to the recording for this. Um, uh, there will be I will get back and get ahead on this class. There will, 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 there will be uh, I didn't I mean to go to the announcements. There will be um, recordings for support vector machines uh, next week, and um, what do we have after that? So, so after this week, um, we're looking at K nearest neighbors and night bays. Then we're looking at support vector machines and decision trees and ensemble learning, um, and that kind of are, are the those next three or four weeks are basically the end of the where we'll be looking at supervised learning here so um oh and and yeah another thing while i'm thinking about it so we didn't really have in our hands-on machine learning textbook um he doesn't really have materials about k and n and naive bays i wanted to add those in just because um well i'll talk about those here uh, in a moment kind of why i added those in but but yeah we didn't really have a chapter on those in our hands-on machine learning um I'll, if anybody finds like a good uh, i didn't find like a good online textbook like an alternative source that uh, for good readings on those I'll, I'll try and find maybe a good chapter or something on those um although i've got some links to some online tutorials that you can maybe read through if, if you're looking for some additional uh information uh, there, there's lots of Tutorials. If you just Google K nearest neighbors or um, naive bays, there's lots of tutorials. So, although I didn't, I never really found one that I really liked a whole lot. So, but um, um, I am still looking for maybe some better uh, materials for these. Um, okay, let's see. So, like I was saying. Um, I'm probably going to be a real long session here today, but but maybe I'll just go through these two notebooks. So let, let me let me come back to kind of why I kind of want to have a section about care nearest neighbors and naive bays here. Um, so just before we did our test um, that I haven't quite got through yet here and gotten back to you yet, but just before we did that, we looked over linear and logistic regression. Um, so these were examples of a um, of, of a technique that's known as a param parametric uh, models, parametric machine learning models. So that's just kind of a fancy term for the, these. Uh, so a linear regression is just um, um, where you have a set of parameters. So what we call the theta parameters, and you use an optimization technique to fit to, to find the 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 best um, you know the optimal set. Of, of values for those parameters in order to um, fit a model, whether it was, you know, a classification model, um, 
like logistic regression or a, a, a regression model like linear regression to, uh, to, to fit those two set of parameters. So those are kind of parametric models. Um, and um, I mean, support vector machines are an example of a parametric well. Uh, actually, support vector machines, as we'll talk about, uh, the basic support vector machines are parametric, but when you start talking about um, using uh, kernel methods, you kind of turn it into non-parametric. So. Uh, decision trees um, are kind of non-parametric as well. So, um, so anyway, um, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Although I probably shouldn't emphasize that so much. So it's not it, it's not really all that uh, big of a deal if if you kind of I mean the, the 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 quintessential idea of a parametric model is the linear regression that we looked at. You know, so it's, it's really that idea of that you have a set of parameters so like the theta parameters and then you're going to use some sort of optimization method okay so with that as kind of background then um, we can look at k nearest neighbors which is kind of the uh, the 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 quintessential idea of a non-parametric kind of method for doing um, um, for, for for doing um, a supervised learning okay so So, and, and k nearest neighbors is, is really simple. It's, it's a very simple idea. So, lots of machine learning classes uh, will actually start you with k nearest neighbors just because it, it's, it's so simple. It's so simple, I probably should have added in here, it's really e easy to implement k nearest neighbors by hand, uh, just even from a description of how it works. Okay. So, so here's, a, here's a description of how k nearest neighbor works. So, all you do, um, uh, you have to have some measure of closeness or similarity, okay? So the, the, the easiest way to think of that is, is if you have a set of features for your data that, that's going to be used for supervised learning, just, just like we've been doing um, for all the other things we've done so far in this class here. So, so if you have a set of numeric features, like, like in this case we're indicating we've got two features. The, the, our X feature are called X1 and X2, or two different features. Um, so if I wanted to make a classifier using k nearest neighbors, uh, just to go down to this figure here. So if I have a new unknown point, uh, I just need to have some measure of similarity so I can pick either the, the one closest neighbor or the two closest neighbors or the three closest neighbors. Okay, so here we're showing that the three closest neighbors apply these three points here to this point here that we're trying to classify, okay? So in, in this example here, we're doing a, a classification task. So the color is meant to represent the label. So red is, you know, so it's a binary classification test. So the, the kind of the obviously red are the, is one class, call that false, you know, or, or whatever. And then the kind of purple issues, the other class, the true or the one class, or vice versa, All right? So um, uh, anyway, back to, to Kate Nearest Neighbor, if, if, if we have some measure of similarity, and, and the simplest measure of similarity is just to use like the distance. So we could use the Euclidean distance. So then, you know, so if I want to classify a new point using the three nearest neighbors, kind of like we're doing here, I just calculate, say, the distance between this point and all of the other points, and then I, uh, and then I sort that and find the three closest. So that's gonna be my three most similar, right? So again, if I, was to, if I was to ask you to write this by hand, which would be make a good um, um, assignment for this class maybe, but um, if I you do this by hand, if, if you just, calculate the, the, the way you would do that is you would calculate the Euclidean distance if we're using distance as the measure of similarity between our new point and all of our existing points. And then you have to sort that so I could find the, the, the closest point um, and then the second most closest, maybe this is the closest, and then the second most closest, and the third most closest up to whatever, you know. So, so you know, if I want the uh, five K and N, so the five most closest points, that might then also be like this point might be the fourth closest, and this point might be the fifth closest, and so on. Right? 
Um, all right, and then to 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 um, to make our prediction, right? So for a classification task, to make our prediction, um, if if we're using like the three nearest neighbors, in this case, it's just and, and if it's a binary classification, it's just going to be whichever class was has the most uh, number in that class. So in this case, since we had two of the reds or two that I called the the falses, we we would predict that this is going to be. Um, a red or, or a false um, here, right? Um, so that's how it works, simply, for, for a classification, right? Um, and if we did the five, uh, five nearest neighbors, it would expand out to these points, it would still, we would still predict three, um, um, the red, because three, uh, we have more in, in the red class closer to this than in the blue class, or the purple class. Um, so it's really, really easy to implement, um, and, and um, um, especially easy to implement if you use um, NumPy and, and vectorize because you can calculate the distance in a vectorized way pretty easily between a new point and all the existing points, um, and then you can just sort the array and, and then take, you know, use array slicing to find the one, two, or three, or however many nearest neighbors, right? Uh, and then there, there are some differences. So you can use k nearest neighbors both for classification and for regression problems pretty easily. So if we're doing a classification problem like we're doing here, you just count up. And if it's binary classification, you know, you just count up the number in the red class, the number in, in the purple class, and whichever had the most would be what you would use as your prediction, right? But this works fine even this is, if it's a multi-class classification. So if I have three different classes, I just count up the ones that are in class one, in class two, and class three, and again, you take the, the biggest one. Although, uh, so, although I mean, um, you do have to have some sort of method for dealing with ties when you're talking about classification, uh, which can be dealt with in different ways, and I can't remember exactly the way it's, so, so if I use like the two nearest neighbors, maybe I've got one red and one purple, you know, one of each class are my nearest ones here. So um, I can't remember exactly how like scikit-learn or what the standard way is to, de to deal with ties for a classification task like that. Um, most likely then you take into account also the, um, your, your distance. Um, so, so you would do something to do like a weighted average of your um, um, distances, of, of your similarity measure. If that makes sense, because yeah, so, so again, for the two nearest neighbors, one is a little bit closer than the other. So you'd probably want to default to predicting that one. So you could do something like use a weighted, um, some sort of a weighting by the similarity or the distance measure um, uh, to, to resolve an issue like that. And you might um, even use that um, um, even if, like, for example, you don't have uh, this problem where, like, like if I use the three nearest neighbors, I mean, there's always going to be one winner if, if I'm just using two classes, if I'm just counting up the absolute. But you might still want to use, like, a weighted, um, some sort of weighting on the distance, you know, to give a heavier weight to things that are close and, and kind of um, give a little bit less importance to things that are further away. So. And again, I can't remember, I need, I, I should probably go and look at the documentation. Um, so I, I think scikit-learn does use weighting uh, for the, the distance measure, but, uh, but I can't remember. So maybe we can check that out here when we get down here. Let me rerun all these here while I'm thinking about it. So, um, all right, so anyway, I mean, the, the basic K nearest neighbors is, is pretty easy to implement, uh, but like, as I'm, as I'm talking here, you can see though you can you can add in um, various uh, other kinds of features to things like like weighting of your of your similarity measurements and things like that. So. And the other the, the the last thing here before I move on um, and look at this is that you can also use k nearest neighbors pretty easily for regression problems as well. Right, um, so this isn't true for the naive bays that we'll talk about here, 
uh, next, but for Caden, there's neighbors, if instead of a class, you know, true, false, or class one, two, three, uh, so for, for a classification task, you have to do, you have to count up votes or something, you know, of, of the K nearest neighbors to come up with your prediction. For a regression problem, it's pretty easy. You just take your K nearest neighbors and then, you know, so your label for a regression problem is just going to be a, a number, right? So in that case, you could just do like the simple average of the, the K nearest neighbors, and that would be your prediction um, for a K nearest neighbor regression, regressor or regression um, algorithm. Right. And again, like I was discussing, you could be a little bit more complicated or a little bit more fancy. So you could use some sort of a weight in uh, a, a weight. Um, so depending on the similarity, make things that are closer uh, be more important for your average for your regression than things that are further away. So just use a simple weighted average. Um, Or you could use other measures. So you could use the median value or, or some other way of com combining the nearest neighbors um, if you're doing a regression, if that would make sense for your problem. But, but, but the default is usually just take the average. So for, for a K nearest neighbors regressor, regression. Um, Okay, so anyway, I mean, KNN is a very basic. It's not it's not usually used um, for more than kind of relatively small data sets. It does have some known problems, which are good to know about. So it's it's a good one to just use um, to 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 get like a baseline feel for what uh, maybe a better um, classifier or regressor might be able to do right so, so it's, it's, it's often like a good because it's so simple that's often a good just start to see and then see if you can do something that will improve on it um, so it, it's known that because measures of similarity and this is a little bit beyond the scope of this course I don't know how to exactly um, uh, kind of prove this but when you have like like here we've only got two-dimensional data but when you start talking about really truly high dimensional data which again in in our day and age having having a data set with thousands or hundreds of thousands of features is not um, all that uncommon um, but once you start having high dimensional data similarity measures tend to have problems and that reduces the effectiveness um, the, the ability for k nearest neighbors to work well either for classification or regression so and also another big drawback again talking about big data for k nearest neighbors um, is that um, because of its not parametric nature so so if i if i Put, if I want to do a prediction for a new point like this point over here, or let's like this point over here, which is clearly a purple if we're doing a classification like here. But in order to find the k nearest neighbors, I have to calculate the similarity between the, the new point I want to predict and point I want to predict for and every other point in the data set. Okay. So the, the time to do the prediction grows linearly with the time with, with the number of data in my data set. Okay. All right. So, so if I have a big data set, that, that, that prediction time can be significant. And that's very different from the linear and logistic regression. So once you've, for linear and logistic regression, once you've um, fit your model and you have your data parameters, the time to make a prediction is going to be, is going to be trivial. It's going to be instantaneous. It's going to be a, a, a constant time to make a prediction for a new value, right? So, so it makes sure you kind of understand that. Is that that's another big drawback about using K and N for in the real world for big data sets. It's 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 um, 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 it's, it's prediction time is linear, uh, so it's going to grow with the size of your data as opposed to like um, a, a parametric model like linear logistic regression, which is going to once once you fit the model, um, the 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 time to the, to do a prediction is um, is constant time basically. So. Um, all 
So yeah, and, and you do have to be, so uh, KNN is, is um, sensitive to, you know, scaling issues. Um, and we've also talked about, you know, the issues of, you know, categorical features in your data set. So um, a lot of that stuff that we talked about um, of why categorical features can be problematic applies for KNN here. So um, um, you have to be careful if you have some or lots of categorical features um, trying to apply K and N to it, so. because you know the, the 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 again just to to remind you about that the the idea of similarity may or may not be um, um, relevant depending on your categorical feature, right? So some categorical features really the the, the idea of similarity doesn't make a lot of sense for them, right? Whereas other uh, categorical features um, are more, um, you know, have, have, have a better idea of similarity between them, so. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, any questions about that? I mean, um, you know, besides that, then um, the rest of the notebook here is just some examples of, 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 of doing some, uh, K and N um, classifiers, so so train using Scikit-Learn. So so um, Scikit-Learn. Um, if you want to use a K and N classifier, um, uh, I mean it, it follows the same uh, format for for the Scikit-Learn library that we've we've seen in terms of training and testing your uh, classifier or your regressor um, using like a, a K nearest neighbors. Um, uh, model so so you know we can apply it to categorical data like the um, the, the iris data set that we've used um, for lots of examples um, so like I said we might want to, to make certain that we scale the features although for the iris data set the, the features are all pretty similar so it probably doesn't have a lot for this one but if we were using um, another data set, uh, we, we definitely, if you want to use KNN, you, know, you want to make certain that you correctly scale your features before trying to apply it. Um, so in, in terms of, the, there's really only one, well, um, the, 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 the major metaparameter for a K nearest neighbors classifier regressor is of course, the number of neighbors you want to take into consideration, uh, you know, when you want to do your prediction, right? Um, so, So uh, just trying to remember what other, um, yeah, so I mean, looking through these other parameters. Um, so this is the other kind of major thing that I was talking about. So I guess by default, it does just use uniform weighting, which means uh, it doesn't use any, any scaling uh, of the weights. So, um, so all points are weighted equally, right? So that would be just uh, like if we're doing a classifier, that would just be counting up. Uh, and again, I don't know how it breaks ties by default if you have two classes that end up with the same. Um, I have to Google that to find out. Uh, but you can ask it to use um, distance weighting, which is basically, you know, um, uh, using some sort of weighting based on the distance or similarity measure, right? So anyway, um, um, besides choosing the weighting, uh, the, normally about the, the only big question if you want to use K's nearest neighbors is what is the good parameter for the number of neighbors to use that, that will give me the best results I can have. So that's, that's normally the meta parameter that you, you have to kind of tune or, or find out for K and N. Right? Um, so anyway, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can create your classifier and you can fit it to your data. So here we, you know, we did a test train split so that we could fit it to just part of the data, so, so to our training data. Um, and um, uh, 
notice in this case, it gets it almost perfectly correct on the, the, uh, the um, held back test data. We just missed one here, looking at the confusion matrix. So, um, so yeah, like I showed you, I mean, the kind of the normal thing you would do um, if, if you want to use a K and N and tune it a bit is you would want to try different values of, of K, of, of how many neighbors. Um, although here, um, so yeah, I mean, this mostly shows that, that any, anything, um, uh, so, so we end up with per perfect prediction a couple of times, but this is going to be a function of, of how we, we um, split. So, so it would probably be, it's a little bit misleading here. We, we'd probably want to, um, to, to, uh, to make this better, we'd want to do some true cross validation here to do it more than once, you know. So, so mostly what this is telling me is probably all values of the nearest neighbors from one up to above 20 or so are mostly given about the same results for the iris data set. And somewhere though above 25 or maybe even 30, um, it starts um, not doing so well, you know, so. Um, okay, anyway, like I said, you know, this, this, um, uh, this is not a real big lecture notebook here. So, you know, K&N is, is a very simple mechanism, um, which is why, like I said, a lot of, a lot of machine learning classes often start with this because it's really easy to understand um, and, and it's really easy to actually use and implement on your own, right? Um, at, at least kind of the basic things of, of K uh, nearest neighbors. Um, it's non-parametric, so it's, it's the quintessential example of what we mean by a non-parametric model because, you know, you really can't do anything ahead of time to make a prediction. So the, every, every time you want to make a prediction of a new point, you, you have to calculate the, the distance or the similarity measure between your point and every other point in the, the set of data that you're using um, for your, the, you know, for your training with. Um, and then, you know, calculate the distance, find the in closest ones, and then use that to either make your classification prediction or your regression prediction. So um, it has some limitations, so it works fine for, for medium to small data sets. So it's often a good baseline to use um, um, to see at least what a minimal kind of acceptable performance should be on a data set that you can expect um, and, and try to improve on from there. So. And if the data set is relatively small, you know, it'll do as well as, as other things. So. So, and like I said, it, it can be used for regression. You have to use the, um, the um, K neighbors regressor. Oh yeah, I said it there. So, so, so um, for scikit-learn, um, you just have to use the K neighbors regressor instead of the, the classifier if you want to do it for a regression task. Um, okay, um, yeah, I think that was all I kind of wanted to say. I, I mean, um, if anybody has any questions, let me know here. Uh, there's not a whole lot of, of stuff, you know, that you can dig into on K Nearest Neighbors, right? So, so, so yeah, if I can find a good textbook source on that, um, uh, the, the only other kinds of complications like we talked about, like I already talked about a little bit are, you know, adding in these ideas of weighting. Um, so, yeah, and so on. Um, you can use different metrics um, for distance, you know, so besides using Euclidean distance, uh, you can use like Manhattan distance or other distances like that. So those are other things, but again, often 
Um, those don't, unless it's, there's a specific reason for the problem, those often don't, don't give you a lot of performance boosts. So. Okay. Um, let me go ahead then and talk a little bit about uh, Bayesian classifier as well. Um, so Bayesian classifier uses Bayes formula, which, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to have run across this before, um, but it's pretty common if you've ever taken a class of statistics, uh, at some point you probably would have been introduced to the idea of, of conditional probability and, and, and looked at this uh, formula for Bayes. Um, I'm not gonna go into kind of the details of, of, of um, of how you derive Bayes' formula for conditional probability or kind of how it works. Um, again, you know, if, if you kind of Google that, there's lots of really good kind of basic, basic explainers on the importance of Bayes' formula and, and conditional probability. But a, a, a naive Bayes classifier um, is, is based on uh, using this to calculate conditional probabilities and then use that to um, make predictions, basically. Right? Um, so a couple things about this is called naive Bayes because um, we're, we're making what's known as an independent assumption. So we're assuming that, that all of the, the, the features um, that we're using to make predictions on our um, label, um, all of them are independent of one another, okay? So um, that's not always a justified uh, assumption, right? So sometimes you have features that, that um, um, have dependencies between them, right? But, but um, um, if we assume that they're completely independent, I mean, that, that's, that's an assumption behind Bayes' formula, right? And if they're not independent, you can't really use this, this formula to calculate conditional probabilities, okay? But uh, normally for data sets that we use, I mean, often the features are pretty independent, or if they're not, we, we do some feature engineering and, and remove the features or combine the features that do have some dependencies so then, you know, we can we can basically then uh, use the uh, naive Bayes assumption of independence. Um, and so anyway, that's kind of where the naive comes um, uh, in the name. Um, the other thing about this classifier about using Bayes is that you really can't use uh, naive Bayes or Bayesian uh, for regression problems. It doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, you can. Um, but uh, you have to um, basically do some stuff like like use kernel functions, which really uh, we'll talk about later when when we when we talk about support vector machines um, and 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 use the what's known as the kernel method. You can apply kind of the same thing, for example, for Bayes classifiers instead of support vector machines. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to really talk about that. So most normally. Uh, uh, the, the basic Bayesian classifier, naive Bayesian is used solely for classification problems, um, typically, okay. So, um, so, so let me just kind of, like I said, you don't really have to completely understand the, the, the details of this formula. I mean, once you know it, you can just plug in these. If, if, you, if I tell you how to calculate these different conditional probabilities, you can plug these in. So normally, like in the example here, normally what we want to do is, uh, and this is just a, a real small made-up example for, for purposes of illustration here, right? So if we want to build a classifier that predicts um, so that we can answer questions like, um, given information that uh, uh, that is currently overcast. So th this is very a very simple data set. Uh, we've only got one feature, so the weather. Um, and again, this is a um, so so a Bayes works fine for um, for features that are categorical, right? 
And if I think about it, you really don't have to, also, you don't have to worry so much about feature scaling because you're not doing anything um, when you're using a Bayesian uh, method um, like, uh, like a distance calculation or anything like that. So you probably really don't, it's probably not necessary that you scale features if you have numerical features all that much. So, um, so anyway, our, our feature is, is like weather, the, the weather, and, and again, this is a categorical feature, you know, so sunny, overcast, rainy. Um, and we want to predict whether we're going to play sports or not play sports based on the weather predict the weather forecast here. Right? And we've got historical information about whether we played or not, depending on whether the, the weather forecast was rainy or sunny or overcast. Okay, and so again, this is a, pi a binary classification task um, here for this example. So normally what we want to do is we want to predict um, whether we play or not given um, our data. So, so here um, H is the hypothesis. Are we going to play or not play based on the data, which is our feature, uh, which is the weather prediction, sunny, overcast, rainy. Okay. But normally norm we don't have that. Um, we don't have the answer to that. that that's the prediction that we want to make. Uh, but we, we can answer other questions, and, and, and so basically we can answer uh, other questions by creating frequency, likelihood and frequency tables from our, our information here. So we, we, can, act, we can answer the, the question whether, you know, the probability of, of whether the hypothesis is true or not. Okay, so the hypothesis is whether we play or not play, right? So among all of our data here, um, nine times out of, the, out of the, the total of the 14 samples we played, okay? So, so the probability that we play or the probability that H is true is nine out of 14, all right? So that's, um, that's the probability of yes here, nine out of 14, looking down at my example here, okay? That was, and, and, and likewise, we can also do the probability of, of D. So the probability D here is, is that it's overcast. So we're, we're, we're trying to predict the probability that we play given that it's overcast. And that's how you read these conditional probabilities. That bar means the probability that it's yes that we play given uh, the data or that, that it's overcast here. Right. So the probability that it's overcast, again, we can just look that up from the table. Um, so um, among the 14 rows where it was overcast, four uh, of, of, our, of our 14 samples uh, for this problem, four times the weather was overcast. So we have information about four times when it was overcast. So the probability is overcast is just four out of 14 using our historical data here um, from our table. Um, and then this one, this is a condition. So, so we can't directly answer this, but if we can find the probability um, um, that's overcast given that yes we played, um, then we can just multiply that times the probability that uh, we played divide, and divide that by the probability it's overcast. And, and Bayes formula tells us that that gives us the probability that we play given that it's overcast, which is what we're trying to find an answer for here, right? So to do that one, we, ha we have to look at only the rows where it's overcast in this case, um, or I'm sorry, probably we, we need to look at all the rows where the answer was yes, that we played, right? So here, we, we, we played in our data set, uh, we actually played the sports nine times, um, and among those nine times, you know, it was overcast over four of the nine times, okay? So that's where this four to nine comes from. Um, I'm here, so. Um, and then if you just plug those in, that would give you the, the probability um, by Bayes formula that, um, that we are gonna play given the information that the day is currently overcast, right? So, um, which was like the 0.97, okay? 
Um, and we can ask, uh, so when, when, when we want to use naive Bayes to do, um, uh, to make a prediction, um, the, the, the data point in this, this case is going to be that we know what the weather forecast is since we've only got one feature, right? So, so it's going to be just one of these, sunny, overcast, rainy. Um, and then we want to ask, okay, what are, so by, by naive Bayes, we're going to predict that we're going to play or not play, right? So that, that's all we're doing here in the example that I gave you. Right? So the first one was um, we're, we're calculating the, the conditional probability that we're going to play given this overcast. And we can do the same thing, calculate the conditional probability that we're not going to play given this overcast. So and in this case, um, there was no instances among the nine. Um, so among all the times when we didn't play, none of those times was it overcast, okay? So in that case, we come up with a conditional probability of zero. Um, and notice these don't necessarily have to add up to one, okay? So these conditional probabilities are, are um, not a um, probability distribution here. So. Um, anyway, but to, to, to make our final calculation then, we, we calculate all these conditional probabilities, and then um, for a classification task, we're just gonna pick the one with the highest conditional probability. So obviously, uh, we're going to predict that yes, we'll play given plugging in these numbers using Bayes' formula for calculating conditional probabilities, right? And that, that's really kind of all there is to it. Um, I mean, there's some deeper things going in, going under the scenes here for conditional probabilities and stuff, but um, a little bit beyond the scope of this course here that I'll talk about here. So. Um, and this, this, this approach, um, um, extends pretty easily when we have more than one feature, right? Um, so for example, again, if I've got two features and, and the output is, is the same, whether we're going to play or not play, um, we're going to be asking questions like, given um, that the weather is overcast and the temperature is mild, will we play or not, all right? So again, this is still a binary classification, but I've now got two features. Uh, again, and both of the features are categorical um, here. Um, so to do that, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple different ways, but again, I can pretty easily just use the table here. So for example, to, this is what I want, the probability it's yes given um, that it's overcast and mild. Um, so by Bayes formula, I need to, to calculate the probability that um, um, it's, that given that we do play, that it's overcast and, and mild. Okay, so then again, I just look all the places where it's yes, um, and and uh, which there were nine of them again as usual. Um, so I'm looking at the calculation of this one here, and then among all the places where it was yes, which are the ones where it was overcast and mild? Okay, so it was overcast and hot here, so that's not. It was rainy and cool and so on. There, there was only one place where it was overcast and mild where it did play. So there's a one in nine for this conditional probability if, if we look at this table. Right? Um, and likewise, you know, you can, you can plug in, find these other probabilities. It's, it's easier just to look at the table and do this rather than do it from sort of a formal definition of these. But um, the probability that's overcast and mild from this table, there's 14. Um, samples that we have, and only one of the 14 samples was it both overcast and mild, if you look through all these, right? So the probability is overcast and mild is, is a 1 in 14 chance, according to our samples of data here, right? Um, so again, if you plug those in, I, this isn't, um, I should try and find a better example, but if you plug those in, you get like a 1 Point zero conditional probability um, that, that yes we're going to play um, if if it's overcast and mild, um, and you get pretty much like a zero probability again conditional probability um, that we won't play when it's overcast and mild. So again, by that you would pick um, um, if you had to make a prediction. Um, the higher one was that, that it's that, that it's yes we will play so that's the one you would pick as your prediction here. So, um, 
So then, I mean, you know, as you can imagine, um, this extends not only to multiple features, but if you have a, a instead of a binary classification, if you have a multi-class classification, you can, um, you know, calculate the conditional probability for um, class one given your input features, and class two, and class three, and so on. Just so, just um, j just calculate these probabilities that you need, plug those in to Bayes' formula, um, and then among all the conditional probabilities, the one that ends up with the highest conditional probability would be the one that you would choose um, um, as your prediction in this case. Right? Um, okay, yeah, and, and I mean, again, that, that's really it. Um, the, kind of the basics of, of using a Bayesian um, naive classifier here. Um, so, oh, like uh, so. Before I go on, one last thing: um, you, you can just calculate like these uh, probabilities that you need every time, right? So, in some sense, you can think of Bayesian. Naive Bayesian is being non-parametric if you just calculated all these. But you could, I mean, as long as you're using the same data set for your predictions, you know, like the same da training data set, you could pre-calculate some or all of these frequency and likelihood tables. So if you did that, you wouldn't have to redo all of your calculations. You could just look them up for whichever ones you needed, right? So in that way, you can make it more Paramet uh, more of an example of a parametric rather than non-parametric method here. Right? And the, the only drawback from that is that if I need to add new samples, so if I'm getting new um, data and I want to use those then um, as part of my predictions, I would have to just recalculate my um, probability tables anytime I want to add in new um, samples um, to be used for predictions here. So. Um, all right. So, and, and kind of like I said, I mean, this, this example isn't really good. We should probably, um, I should, I should probably add in some better examples here, um, um, for these, but, um, um, if you want to use scikit-learn, um, um, however you create your data set, uh, it, it'll look the same. So, you know, if we have our features, um, which in our second example were the features were the, the weather forecast and the, the temperature forecast, I guess, uh, or the weather and the temperature as, as input features, um, and the label was uh, yes, we'll, we play or no, we don't play, our prediction, right? So, but, but given those, you know, um, you can fit a classifier um, like we've done. Um, um, for a Gaussian um, naive Bayes, so NB stands for naive Bayes here from scikit-learn. Um, and yeah, notice, I mean, there's, you really don't, uh, I can't think of any kind of metaparameters that you would normally, um, you can actually specify um, some things, like you, you can give it some prior probabilities. Um, which, um, yeah which I won't talk about here. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's um, um, really, there's not a lot of metaparameters you would normally tune for naive Bayes. So again, naive Bayes is relatively simple. Um, if, if you kind of ignore the fact that there's some deep stuff going on with um, the conditional probability kind of thing. But, but if you just think of that as a formula, formula to calculate to, to, that you need to plug in uh, in order to calculate numbers, and then, then you, Basically, your prediction becomes the, the biggest one. So the highest probability or conditional probability is going to be what you predict um, at the end of things here. So, um, so yeah, and, uh, anyway, yeah, if, if you kind of predict it on overcast mild, you'll see that you get one, which was the encoding for the yes play here. Oh, and notice, um, 
So notice, though, this, this is the actual prob uh, conditional probabilities that you get for the, 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 the no and the yes. Um, I need to dig in there a little bit. I was expecting this to be exactly one and exactly zero. So probably, um, I'm guessing that the smoothing here um, does something. So maybe if I made smoothing exactly zero, you get exactly the conditional probabilities. Um, no, no. <laughs> okay. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm not exactly certain why you don't get exactly that, but um, but but you know you're basically getting pretty muchly. Um, like we were talking about here with um, there must be a little bit of a difference from what's happening from what I described, but not too much. So. Um, okay, and yeah, there was another example. I mean, it, you know, it, it's pretty easy to extend that. Uh, again, you could, you could implement naive Bayes pretty easily by hand as well. Um, if I asked you to do that, um, um, just given this formula, um, for conditional probability um, and, and figuring out how to, to, to correctly calculate the, the probabilities you would need um, uh, from um, a, a set of data, right? So, but, but it extends um, um, easily to uh, multi-class classification problems. So yeah, we just had another example of that um, where we used it on. This is another data set. I don't think we've used this one before. Uh, another one that's used in a lot of Examples for machine learning: this wine data set, where um, uh, basically the classes were kind of like the quality of the of the wine. So a low class, medium class, and a high class wine here, and you try to predict that um, um, the quality of the wine or the, the the class quality of the wine from measurements, you know, like its acidity and things like that. So. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, this, this data set though is small, it's, it is relatively um, tough to get pretty good accuracy. So, so notice you do get 90% accuracy um, with the naive Bayesian, which is, you know, pretty good um, on this data set actually without doing a lot of tuning and stuff. Um, All right, um, yeah, like I said, I was a little bit tired today, and uh, since I didn't really have the test stuff, um, I think that that was kind of all I was planning on going over here. Um, so let me know if there's any kind of last minute questions here, if anybody wants to talk about anything. I don't have a question, but I would thought I'd say something about um, the O'Reilly Books Learning website online is free to us, and it has our textbooks in there. Oh, does it? People, yeah, well, it's thirty-eight thousand of their te te of their books are posted, and they're completely free to us speak through the college. All right, um, all right. Yeah, I didn't so, know. That you have to be logged into the like library to do that. Uh, you're my actually, little. It is, when I click on it from the database website, it just takes you to the general website, and then you use your your TAMUC uh, email address. And then I, for me, I only have the Leo mail, and it worked fine. But I'm sure it'll work for any of the professors with that address as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a great resource. And yeah, it's good to know. I, I use O'Reilly books quite a bit, so yeah, it's nice to know that, you, that people can get those if they need them um, just from that. So I'll have to put that up somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. I can send you the information and the link. To, it, it shows you can find the, the O'Reilly under the database um, collection, the databases listed in the library website. Right. And you go to O and it'll show it on there. It comes up right at the top. Um,
the, the exact URL is learning.oreilly.com without the apostrophe, of course. And O'Reilly's O R E I L L Y. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll try that. Uh, yeah, so sign in with your institution. institution so. Yeah. And you probably have to create an ID for it. Um, all right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'll to try yeah, it out. no problem. Um, I have something else for you after you're done recording and when everybody else has gone to, which I wanted to talk to you about. Okay. So. All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. So I will see you guys later then.